Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. A former Rideau Hall staffer felt ostracized and ignored because of her race, and now she's warning the problems there go beyond the former governor general. I think that was the eye-opening event that told me that this place was not for you. A CBC exclusive, the event that made her leave. The only time that it's good to be old. In some provinces, new details on when and where you'll be getting your COVID-19 vaccine. Also, former Liberal MP Selena Caesar Chavan, her tumultuous time in the Trudeau government. And that's a hell of a thing to say to the Prime Minister. When the Prime Minister is speaking to me like a child, what, what am I supposed to say? Am I still supposed to be polite? Plus, the battle over butter is spreading or not. I had noticed for a while that butter was more solid. The ingredient that could be to blame. This is The National. The office of the Governor General is under fire again, even as that top post remains unfilled, and we have the exclusive. Tonight, a former employee tells her story of alleged racial discrimination at Rideau Hall because she wants change. Now, this is separate from the multiple allegations of bullying and mistreatment of staff that saw Julie Payette and her top aide step down. Ashley Burke's original reporting brought that to a head. Now she looks at an issue of urgent concern through the whole civil service. I feel I have no option but to discontinue my employment with the office, effective immediately. This is not a letter Khadija Al Halali wanted to write, but she says her treatment at Rideau Hall left her no choice but to leave. I felt ostracized. Like, I just felt like I was inferior, that I was um, insignificant. My voice didn't matter because I was racialized. Hired as a university student in 2018, El Halali says she hit her breaking point two years later after being reprimanded for speaking up at work about racism. I can breathe. This video excruciating for her to watch the killing of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police. Black, black, black sparking protests worldwide, including on Parliament Hill. At Rideau Hall, silence on the issue. After a week, El Hilali sent this email to all 200-plus Rideau Hall staff about Floyd's death and how it affected her. My heart is heavy and I am hurting, she wrote. It is not the job of only black people and people of color to continuously speak up against racism. I invite and urge you to use your privilege to make a change. Immediately. Uh, I received a call and I was forced to recall the email. The narrative that I was, I was told was that this was a political matter and that the organization is apolitical. El Halali says the same superior who reprimanded her the next day praised a white colleague for having the courage to speak up about the same issue during a staff meeting. I did feel very hurt. Um, I remember crying for what felt like days. Um, I think that was um, the eye-opening event that told me that this place was not for you. It sounds like the status quo. Erica I. Phil filed a human rights complaint alleging discrimination, harassment and bullying against her over the past decade in the public service. It was abusive, to be honest. If we speak up, we face reprisal from management, and there goes our ability to um, advance in our careers. El Halali is now petitioning for mandatory diversity training at Ottawa universities, so the next generation of civil servants knows better than this one. Anti-black and any sort of racism is not political. It is a basic human right that everyone deserves. Okay, so Ashley, how is the government responding to all of this? Well, Andrew, we contacted all of the members of management involved in El Halali's case, but none provided a comment. Rito Hall did say it's in the midst of an important period of renewal and that it endorses the recent call to action by the head of the civil service to end discrimination in its ranks. All of this as the prime minister prepares to tell us this week how the next governor general will be selected. Ashley Burke, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Quebec's premier named his new anti-racism minister today, a man who is already environment minister. One of my job will be uh, to uh, make sure everybody uh, know uh, what are their rights and what they uh, can do uh, to make sure uh, these situations don't happen again. 
Responding to a reporter, Benoit Charette said the color of his skin should not exclude him from a job that's meant to fight racial discrimination. The minister said no one can deny that minority groups face discrimination, but like his government, says he doesn't believe there is systemic racism in the province. Turning now to the pandemic, some optimism today with new details about vaccines set to arrive in the coming weeks. The prime minister has announced the next two shipments of the Moderna vaccine. 460,000 doses the week of March 8th, 840,000 two weeks later. Trudeau says Moderna is on track to exceed the promised 2 million doses by the end of March. Also today, more details from Pfizer. It's expected to ship 1.5 million doses in early April, but we have a long way to go. Canada has only given about 1.5 million shots, less than half a million have been fully vaccinated with a second dose. So when will your turn come? Vicodopia has the new details on that. It's the sign so many Albertans have been waiting for. Bob Zerbecki managed to book an appointment this morning and now he's getting his shot at this pop-up clinic. It's good to be old. Getting an appointment came with some frustration. Alberta's online booking tool crashed and government phone lines were jammed. I can tell you that my daughter tried very, very hard online to get online, but was unable to. So we came out to a site and they wouldn't let, Pat, let her go past the doorway. After vaccine delays, some provinces are moving ahead faster than others to get shots into the general public, beginning with the oldest. In Alberta today, those 75 years old and up started getting shots. In Manitoba, it was 95 and up. New Brunswick is already vaccinating those 85 and older. In Quebec, 85-year-olds can book appointments tomorrow. For Ontario, those 80 and up will have to wait until mid-March. And Ontarians under 60 won't get a shot until August at the earliest. I'd love to say, yeah, you know, by Labor Day weekend, we're going to have every single person in Ontario who is eligible and who wants a vaccine to have one. Uh, I'm a little bit reluctant to do that because it depends on the arrival of those vaccines. Ontario and other provinces are still promising priority groups such as healthcare workers, Indigenous people and those who are at high risk of getting sick will get vaccinated earlier. Focusing on seniors, I think, is the right way to go. Um, it reduces the fear in the population definitely takes the lethality of a disease out of the equation, which is really what most people care about anyway. Despite the lack of firm dates by the provinces and no word about the approval of new vaccines, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau once again insisted today any Canadian that wants a vaccine will get one by the end of September. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. The United States is one step closer to approving its third COVID-19 vaccine. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has concluded Johnson & Johnson's single-dose vaccine is safe and effective. That paves the way for it to be authorized for emergency use within days. The company's regulatory approval from Health Canada is still under review. And a flight carrying 600,000 doses of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine landed in Ghana today. That marks the first shipment delivered through the COVAX vaccine sharing initiative. The plan is to deliver about 2 billion doses to low and middle income countries to ensure everyone has access. Well, COVID-19 infections are on the decline in First Nations communities across Canada. But today, the federal government said it's worried about how variants could change that. The potential consequences can be devastating um, for, the, for the reasons that you, Willow, have documented in the past, um, historical inequities, uh, th this, this virus can spread very quickly. So far, they have not found any variants of concern in First Nations communities, but the worry from health officials is that it could just be a matter of time. Now, housing is certainly one of the inequities faced by Indigenous people, and COVID-19 has just compounded the crisis. 360 kilometers north of Thunder Bay, Ontario, is the Yavmatung First Nation. It has few resources to keep the spread of the virus in check and nearly 100 people on a waiting list for a home. Olivia Stefanovic shows us how people are being forced to make a temporary measure permanent. I'm outside the residence of Irene Boyce family home. This was supposed to be a temporary COVID-19 shelter. 
one of many for quarantine and to help with overcrowding in a remote northern Ontario First Nation. Yeah. But now these plywood walls, reinforced by blankets and two by fours, are a permanent family home. It doesn't feel good at all because I have two children that, um, that I do worry about. Irene Boyce is one of 93 people in Yamatung First Nation waiting for a house. If we don't have the wood burning all the time, we, it will get cold in there pretty quick. New Democrat MP Charlie Angus was contacted by the community for help. We could have, you know, fires in those tents. We could have children getting sick. And we He's now pressing the Indigenous Services Minister for immediate action. And this is happening under his watch. When is he going to actually say, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. We're going to do something. Mark Miller calls the situation unacceptable. We need to act more swiftly, on, or specifically on housing. The Grand Chief of the Territory, Nishnabiaski Nation, says Yamatung is not the only community struggling. I hope uh, you know, the federal officials, uh, even provincial officials, see uh, what is going on. And, and, and Alvin Fiddler uh, says all 49 First Nations he represents are grappling with overcrowding. These communities are growing and yet uh, the government has not uh, adjusted their, their policies or their funding structures to meet that growing demand. In the meantime, people in Yabatung will stay in these makeshift shelters until the community and government find a lasting solution. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. All primary school students in Quebec's red zones will soon have to wear masks in the classroom as the province looks to counter the increasing spread of variants within schools and daycares. Currently, it's more than three uh, quarters of our outbreaks that are in the primary school. CBC News has confirmed the new measures will begin after spring break. They take effect March 8th in the Greater Montreal area and one week later in the other red zones. An online challenge is believed to have played a role in the death of a teen in Saskatoon. The boy's mother says pandemic isolation was a factor too. Bonnie Allen listened to her warning and took it to an expert. He had a lot of charisma and passion for life. Melanie Anderson says her 13-year-old son Cash lived life at full speed, always wearing out shoes and usually on a skateboard. He was just focused and alive and he was so good at it and he, it brought him a lot of confidence. But in early February, she says the pandemic was wearing on him. She had COVID-19 and the entire family was in quarantine. I had a parental app on his phone and would take his phone at night. But he was, I couldn't take it from him anymore because during this pandemic, um, that is their only connection to the outside world. She discovered her son dead in his bedroom. He had died from asphyxiation. Anderson says it didn't appear to be suicide, and an emergency responder suggested Cash could have been doing what's known as the choking challenge or pass-out challenge on TikTok. This one I've seen heralded actually as the good kids high. So by trying to deprive their brain of oxygen, it almost creates a bit of uh, a sense of it feels good. But it's very dangerous, even deadly. An important piece is really to understand the driving forces underneath this. It's not just simply uh, social media by itself, but it's childhood. It's it's the uh, want to feel recognized, the the need to feel validated. Dr. Aisha Kurji says isolation and boredom are exacerbating factors. You have more time on your own to do things and experiment with things that maybe you wouldn't have had before because you were in activities and keeping yourself busy in other ways. He needed somewhere to release that energy. Anderson may never know for sure what her son was doing when he died, but she wants other parents to pay attention just in case. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Well, police in Winnipeg say 11 people have been arrested in connection with a high-level interprovincial cocaine trafficking network. Winnipeg police call it the biggest drug seizure of its kind in the city's history. Drugs, cash, weapons, property, all seized, valued at more than $11.5 million. Those arrested are alleged to have ties to a gang called The Company, which is set to move illicit drugs from Vancouver to Winnipeg. 
Well, it was one of the biggest financial frauds in Canadian history, involving hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands of everyday investors. A group of Montreal businessmen was convicted, but a lot of that money mysteriously gone. Well, now an investigation by the CBC's Fifth Estate reveals some new clues about those missing millions. Here's Mark Kelly. Janet Watson and Catherine McDonald carry their nightmare in these bankers' boxes, defrauded of much of their retirement savings 15 years ago. It was panic right at the beginning, and then it was incredible anger. Do you believe to this day that these characters have money stashed away? Yes. Three co-conspirators were convicted in the fraud in 2016. The evidence shows they moved investors' money to offshore tax havens and beyond, where it vanished. Millions never found. I learned over the years dealing with these situations that in, when people commit fraud, um, they almost always uh, have money hidden somewhere in the world. But an investigation by the Fifth Estate and Radio Canada's enquête has tracked down four companies set up here on the Isle of Man when the fraud began. Three of the four shut down when the fraud was exposed. Well, where did the, money go? the companies were linked to a Canadian trained accountant we tracked down in Bermuda back in 2017. He refused to speak to us. Who are you protecting? One of the three convicted fraudsters, Lino Matteo, is now out on parole and agreed to speak to the Fifth Estate. Here's what I'm going to say, okay? Anyone that lost money is absolutely entitled to be upset. When pressed for details of that fraud... I view your question as insulting. In fact, we're going to stop. Stop the cameras, please. With new clues, there have been calls for the RCMP to open an investigation and for Parliament to look into the affair in the ongoing hunt for the missing millions. Mark Kelly, CBC News, Toronto. And hey, you can see the full investigation tomorrow night on CBC Television and CBC Gem. The Missing Millions, a story of secret accounts, exotic tax havens, and even the mafia. That's at 9 p.m., 9.30 in Newfoundland and Labrador. Alberta announces its latest budget tomorrow, and thanks to higher oil prices, it has billions more dollars to work with. But as Aaron Collins shows us, it doesn't necessarily mean the oil patch is on the comeback trail. Want a sense of just how quiet Alberta's oil patch is these days? Drop in on a company that relies on it. There should be cutting, grinding, drilling, welding. It should be quite noisy in here. Bill Brewer's family's been making parts for the energy sector here since the 70s. They aren't making many these days. They've had to lay off more than half of their workers, and it's a struggle just to keep the ones they have left busy. For Brewer, oil and gas is a family affair. His brother-in-law runs an oil field services company. Same story there. Business is down 70% in the last year, but they've resisted layoffs, hanging on, hoping for the price of oil to take off again. A lot of the smaller and medium-sized supply and service companies are holding our breath somewhat and trying to tread water. The price of West Texas Intermediate has edged back above $60 per barrel, and there are signs it could rise even higher. It's not unreasonable in moments like this to see particularly volatile bouts up 70, 80, no, even higher potentially, but it wouldn't last. That means investment in the oil and gas industry isn't likely right away, but those higher prices are a windfall for Alberta's government now, potentially trimming billions off the deficit but not enough to balance the province's books. If there is any kind of short-term, I mean, five to 10 year windfall in terms of oil, uh, you know, oil prices, that's only going to help to fill in the hole uh, that we've already dug for ourselves. Back at that Calgary factory, they haven't seen business pick up yet, and they've never seen a slump quite like this one. We have had peaks and valleys over the years. Uh, this is definitely probably the lowest one we've had. Still, there is hope that the price of oil will continue to rally, that the final curtain isn't falling on the oil and gas industry quite yet. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Well, if you've been spending more time cooking or baking these days, you may have noticed a change to a kitchen staple. I had noticed for a while that butter was more solid. Up next, the hard truth about Canadian butter. Plus, a CBC News exclusive, my conversation with Jamal Khashoggi's fiancé 
and another Saudi dissident. There is no real accountability and there is no real act uh, against the killers. What they're worried about for people in Canada. And later, from cars to electronics, what's fueling a shortage in microchips? The supply chain is broken. We're back in two. Well, so many Canadians have been passing time by baking their way through this pandemic. And with that, demand for butter has been growing. But for months, some very observant bakers have been noticing something mysterious. They say the butter is becoming firmer. As Tanya Fletcher tells us, experts think they know why. This one's going to be harder. At this French bakery in Vancouver, butter is an obvious staple. But they noticed something changed when they had to start tweaking some of their recipes a few months ago. It was around that time the shift started happening, and so we were sort of going, well, maybe it's because we're doing it a little bit differently, but then after a couple months, we decided, no, the butter itself was different. That same observation has been made by many a foodie across the country. I had noticed for a while that butter was more solid. And this food writer in Calgary realized early on in the pandemic that butter was slower to melt. So she put it out to social media and quickly found out she wasn't alone. And I got over a thousand comments on Facebook and hundreds on Twitter and everyone was like, I thought it was just me. A theory emerged suggesting palm oil was being used in livestock feed. And sure enough, it is. The Dairy Farmers of Canada confirmed in a statement saying, quote, palm products, including those derived from palm oil, are sometimes added to dairy cows rations in limited amounts. It points out it's a common practice around the world, often used to enhance milk production and generate more saturated fat. Look for the blue cow logo. The Canadian milk industry has long touted its reputation for quality and purity. Critics say using the supplement jeopardizes all of that. When you actually throw palm oil into the fold, it doesn't marry well with the blue cow image that uh, the industry is trying to convey to the Canadian public. Now, the group representing thousands of milk producers in Quebec is calling for an end to the use of palm oil due to environmental reasons. The Dairy Farmers of Canada says it's forming a committee of experts to look into the issue. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. When we come back, a warning from a Saudi dissident about the threats he fears in this country. Do you have any feeling that they're still up to something with you? A CBC News exclusive with Omar Abdulaziz and Jamal Khashoggi's fiance. And later, former Liberal MP Selena Caesar Chavan on her strong words for the Prime Minister. And that means he will not hold back and he will speak out when there are concerns he has about uh, human rights abuses. A phone call between U.S. President Joe Biden and Saudi Arabia's King Salman is expected to happen soon. The White House is calling it a recalibration in the relationship between the two countries. But complicating that, a U.S. intelligence report soon to be released into the murder of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. It's expected to say that this man, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, widely seen as the kingdom's de facto leader, ordered Khashoggi's death. Now, it's been more than two years since Jamal Khashoggi walked into the Saudi consulate in Turkey where he was then murdered, dismembered, his remains never to be found. Details of how that murder came to be are still murky for most of us or were until the documentary The Dissident outlined how Saudi hacking in Canada set the path. I, I spoke exclusively with Omar Abdulaziz and Jamal Khashoggi's fiancé about the threats that still linger even here even now. I know why Jamal was killed. It's because of me. As the documentary The Dissident makes clear, Omar Abdulaziz came to Canada to save his own life and speak openly. But it doesn't make him free. It now makes him lonely, living with the twin burdens of guilt and fear. Some people would tell me, it's not your mistake, it's not your fault. But the guilt is killing me. I want to be honest with you. So many guilt because he's worried it was his relationship with Jamal Khashoggi that helped lead to the murder of the outspoken Saudi critic in a consulate in Turkey more than two years ago. 
the two men had been communicating, both Saudis in exile, both afraid of one day being harmed for their criticisms of Mohammed bin Salman. They leaned on each other, talked, exchanged messages. <laughs> Jamal sending Omar money to help with his work exposing the regime. <laughs> and as the documentary outlines in sad details, Jamal, don't mean, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. You don't have to go to them. Jamal was adamant that Omar be very suspicious of the Saudi officials who showed up in Montreal a few years ago. He begged Omar, do not listen to their urgings to return to Saudi Arabia. Was especially serious that Omar not follow their instructions to go to the Saudi embassy in Ottawa to get documents. And they told me, you know, it's only to renew your passport. Please just come with us. We don't know what was waiting for us there. I refused. They went back to Saudi. Six weeks later, they hacked my phone. So they had the ability to listen to every single phone call that I was making. They had the ability to read my conversations with Jamal Khashoggi and other activists. And they basically, that they were spying on Canadian people. That was the summer of 2018. The Saudi hackers tracked Omar throughout Montreal, every communication tapped into. Then they went after all close to him, anything to shut him up. They tortured my brothers, my friends, and they were blackmailing me using my own private messages, photos, information. I didn't cooperate with them again. Few weeks later, by the 2nd of, of October, they killed Jamal Khashoggi. The murder happened inside the Saudi consulate in Turkey. Jamal's body never to be found. Omar still cannot understand why his friend went inside after warning him against doing the same thing in Canada. The woman waiting for Jamal Khashoggi for nearly 12 hours was Hatice Cengiz, his fiancée. He had gone in to get documents for their marriage. For two years, she's fought for accountability, but to open up for the documentary was a big decision. Nice to meet you, Adrian. Nice to meet her you. Her conversation with us was her first North American broadcast interview. Okay. She wants to be heard. I was leaving that the, the, the darkness on my own, in my life and in my heart. Now I believe that people around the world will feel the same thing with me, like I'm sharing my pain with the, the world. The pain of that staggering murder and the extent of the Saudi cover-up. Are you a bit surprised that nothing seems to have happened to the killers of Jamal? There is no real accountability and there is no real act uh, against the killers uh, inside Saudi Arabia and uh, pressure from the, any government. After years of American coziness with Saudi Arabia, there are promises of change from a Biden administration including a promise to declassify the report into Jamal Khashoggi's murder. Hatija heard many promises to stand with her, including from the likes of Jeff Bezos, who as owner of the Washington Post was Jamal Khashoggi's employer, a man who had also been hacked and hounded by the Saudis. We are here and you are not alone. And yet you will not find the documentary The Dissident on Bezos's Amazon streaming service. It's not on Netflix either. Fear of Saudi reprisals, perhaps? Wouldn't be the first time that happened. And the story of the threat to dissidents didn't stop with Jamal's murder. Just weeks after he was killed, a team of assassins reportedly tried to get into Canada to kill another prominent Saudi critic, Saad al-Jabri, who fled to this country just like Omar did. Quick-thinking border guards thought something was suspicious and stopped the men from entering Canada. Thank God that we live in, in, in a decent place, in a decent country. We're not in a banana republic. Or I would be killed. Mr. Saad al-Jabri would be killed. So I'm really worried about Saudi dissidents who live here in Canada. Do you have any feeling that they're still up to something with you? A uh, few months ago, I received a phone call from the RCMP. Uh, they were telling me that you are a potential target. And I was contacted by different... Uh, journalists around the world, they're telling me that they received some confirmed news uh, that MPS is going to keep doing what he's doing. 
And so this is life now for Omar Abdulaziz. 23 of his family and friends arrested back in Saudi Arabia, some begging him to stop his criticism of the regime. In the past, I was filming with only me and a cameraman. He won't. He's only getting louder. And now I can imagine millions watching this. The truth always wins. And Hatice Cengiz, without her love. Please take action. Thank you. Still without justice for her love, but determined to believe that in the telling of the truth, no one forgets what happened to Jamal Khashoggi. Oh, so, so Adrian, that, that, that is a, a truly chilling notion raised in the piece, right? This idea that, that Saudi dissidents in Canada could be in jeopardy. That, indeed. Uh, and the worry is real, Andrew. I, I was in contact with the Ministry of Public Safety who say that they're aware of allegations about a young man, um, young Saudi man in particular, who was living in Montreal, uh, was a critic of the regime. According to his friends, he seems to have very suddenly left Canada for Saudi Arabia. His friends are very worried. Um, I've also been in contact with a government source who says that uh, officials have taken steps to try to confirm his well-being. The bottom line is we don't really understand the circumstances of why he left, right. uh, but we're staying on it. Okay. Well, after the break, I sit down with former Liberal MP Selena Caesar Chavez. I mean, that's a hell of a thing to say to the Prime Minister of the country. What she said to Justin Trudeau then and her message now. Plus, keeping up with pandemic demand, how you may already be feeling the impact of a microchip shortage. There's a word to describe the time Selena Caesar Chavan spent in federal politics, tumultuous. A Liberal MP turned independent, who eventually left politics altogether. But in her new memoir, she is aiming to set the record straight about her experience in Ottawa, using some very strong language. And a warning, some viewers may find that language offensive. She was part of the Liberal wave in 2015. Selena Caesar Chavan claimed victory as MP for Whitby. New to politics, full of optimism. We're being open and transparent with Canadians. But that optimism waned over the next four years, feeling marginalized, pigeonholed. Multiple clashes with the PM, some of them awkwardly public, ended with her resignation. I'm going, so yeah. Okay, so I'm good. I have uh, just been notified by my office that uh, uh, Selena Caesar Chavan has uh, decided to sit as an independent. Canadians know her as someone who doesn't mince words. I think I'm going to call it out when I see it. But her new memoir, Can You Hear Me Now, tells a different story. One about often falling short when it comes to speaking up. Selena Caesar Chavan, Andrew here. Very nice to, to link up with you. Hi, Andrew. It's such a pleasure to be on with you this evening. I'm curious to know, what is it that you wish the Prime Minister, in your mind, had, had understood about you a little bit better? Um, when you formally took your place in government? I wanted him to know that, you know, I was smart, I was strategic, and I was able to help with policy. And I didn't want to be a token in his government. I really was fascinated with the fact that he was talking about ad women change politics, a feminist approach, and that diversity was our strength, an, an intersectional approach. And that really fascinated me. And I wanted, I really wanted to bring that to bear in politics. But you're, you're saying you felt silenced, that you felt tokenized. I mean, the, the, the PMO would and, and has framed it very differently, right? Like The Prime Minister doesn't see it that way. Well, it's not that I felt tokenized, Andrew. Uh, there's, there's evidence of that. In my role with the Prime Minister, the three international events that I attended were uh, the state visit to Washington, in which I only met Obama. I had no other meetings or anything else to do during that, that whole time. Uh, the opening of the National African American Museum in Washington, again, no other meetings, and the inauguration of President Okufuado in Ghana. All three of those international events had a very specific focus, and it was related to my blackness. It was embarrassing to know that I was not actually hired because I was strategic or because I had business acumen or research background. It was for my blackness and that, that I didn't appreciate. So the frustration that you would have been feeling at this time ultimately culminates in a pretty 
explosive exchange over the phone between you and the Prime Minister where you say what? Well, the, the conversation was a courtesy call to tell him that I was no longer going to be running in the 2019 election. And um, what I had thought naively was that I was going to get the prime minister saying, you know, Selena, I value your your contribution. I, I hope that you run again. I didn't get any of that. What I got was, you know, Selena, I can't have you make this announcement today because Jody Wilson-Raybould resigned today and I can't have two powerful women of color leave. Um, he went on to talk about his privilege and how people keep talking about his privilege. He went on to say that I should appreciate him. I should appreciate what he's done for me in the time that I've been in, in government as if I didn't work hard. And at the end of it, you know, at the end of his rant, I said, you know, motherfucker, who the fuck do you think you're talking to? Um, you know, if he had spoken to any member of my constituency, any 130,000 member of, of Whitby that way, I would have had said the exact same thing and I'd likely do it again. Okay, oh, oh, okay, but, but I mean, that's a hell of a thing to say to the prime minister of the country, right? Well, it's not, just, it's not just a hell of a thing to say to the prime minister. When the prime minister is speaking to me like a child, like someone that he happens to own within his, his government, what, what am I supposed to say? Am I still supposed to be polite in that context? I don't think so. Well, let, let, me, let me ask you this. Um, and this is actually something that, that you acknowledge uh, almost first and foremost in the book, that in the aftermath of that phone call, um, where ultimately you decide that you need to leave the party and, and sit as an independent, virtually the very next day, you were getting calls from black community leaders who, who were disappointed in a way, that you, know, that, that you had a seat at the table and you got up and left. I mean, what was your answer to that? Well, sometimes, the, the, as I said in the book as well, sometimes the bravest thing that you can do, the, mo the best thing that you can do is to leave, especially when um, you know that what is happening at the table doesn't serve you. Um, and I knew that what was happening with myself and the prime minister did no longer served, served me. It no longer served the constituents of Whippy. You know, I'm curious also, though, to know when you look at what's happened since your departure, I mean, the world's a busy place, right? And, and even if we just look at the pandemic, I mean, disproportionately affects black people, black women, black students, black businesses. Do you, do you look at what's happened since and, I don't know, like, like think to yourself, gosh, I, I wish I, I, I was there or there was some way for me to be there so that I could have the influence today or, or that I could offer my perspective today. I think this is less about me being at that table and more about the fact that the, the, the government of, of today is doing a lot of performing, a lot of saying that they're going to do things, a lot of writing things down that, you know, we need to dismantle systemic racism, but not actually doing the job. Yeah. And, and you know, consistently, though, you, you have advocated for other black women and black men, for, for that matter, to get involved, right, to, to engage in that political process and, and even to run themselves. I still wonder what will they take away, do you think or do you hope, from your experience in Parliament? I'm very candid about my story because I don't want people to be surprised, because I want them to know that, um, that these tensions exist, that, that the, the racism that I experienced, that sexism exists there, that, the, that discriminatory practices still exist. Now, is it an indictment on the whole institution? No, it's an opportunity to do better. Selena Caesar Chavan, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Andrew. I appreciate it. Thank you to your viewers. So one thing I should add to this is that we did reach out to the Prime Minister's office to put some of Cesar Chavan's account of her time in government to the current government, and they did issue a statement to us saying that the Prime Minister deeply respects Cesar Chavan, that he's always been committed to creating an op, uh, sort of an, an environment where he feels like his members can come to him uh, if they have concerns, but that ultimately his conversations with his MPs are private. And what about her future? Right. Yeah. So, so I did ask her, does she have any interest in, in potentially running again? And her answer was sort of an enthusiastic, emphatic yes. Um, not under a Team Trudeau banner. She made that pretty clear. Not even necessarily for the Liberals. She was pretty guarded about the whole thing. But, of course, uh, suffice to say, saying that you're interested in running is a little bit different from 
actually running, so we shall see. All right, still ahead, a pandemic opportunity. Why one Regina couple decided to open their own business during this moment. But first, microchip shortages are halting car production across North America. We'll look at how your increased use of electronics is connected to the problem. I'm Jimmy Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, a manslaughter conviction for the man who killed Cindy Gladjew closes a long legal saga. But for Gladjew's family, healing has just begun. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. We don't see them much, but semiconductors are really important for our electronic devices, appliances, even our cars. Well, as Peter Armstrong shows us once again, the coronavirus is getting in the way. Max Nekrasov is relentless, not just playing the game Godfall. The real competition was finding a PlayStation 5 to buy. It can take really a few months before you can get one because the stock is just there's not that much at all. Sony can't source enough microchips to keep up with demand. Production is way behind, leaving frustrated customers waiting unhappily. So 15-year-old Nekrasov started tracking resupply websites to find one for himself, then launched a Twitter account to share that information. I just kind of wanted to, um, you know, help others. Whenever a retailer restocks their shelves, Nekrasov tweets out to his 20,000 followers, many of whom have him to thank for their new gadget. A lot. I can't, I, I don't think I can count them, but a lot. That same microchip shortage is wreaking havoc around the world. And just about everything has a chip in it. Your car, your phone, even toasters and coffee makers. The supply chain is broken. Nikola Dimitrov needs microchips to run his precision imaging machines to assemble key auto parts. He's still trying to fill orders that were due back in December. It's hard to take how much money, but uh, it's definitely a substantial amount of, of uh, money that it's um, being drained. Chrysler temporarily shut down its Windsor, Ontario plant due to the shortage. General Motors has idled three of its plants, including one in Ingersoll, Ontario. We have an incredibly interconnected global economy. This professor of strategic management says the pandemic changed global demand patterns. We all bought more electronics, but fewer cars and trucks. Automakers scaled back production. Now we're in 2021, demand is coming back, orders for chips are coming back, and the companies that make the chips have to scale up production. But as long as much of the world is stuck at home buying more tech gadgets than usual, the longer it will take for the supply chain to catch up. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. The Canadian skincare company Decium will be sold to the global cosmetics giant Estee Lauder. The deal is worth more than $2 billion. Toronto-based Decium is best known for shaking up the industry with low prices and no-frills packaging, hitting it big with this line of skincare products called The Ordinary. The last few years have been anything but ordinary for Decium, with its troubled founder, Brandon Truax, ousted from the company and later dying suddenly in 2019. Well, next on The National, starting a business in the middle of a pandemic. We're into business. I'm actually like making money. <laughs> Why these entrepreneurs decided to take the risk. Next in our moment. Well, this Regina couple took a big risk. It actually started a business in the middle of the pandemic. And so far, they say their risk is paying off. They decided to focus on a specific market, offering expertise in black hairstyles. And they're one of the few Regina hair salons to do it. So tonight, their story is our moment. When we started this business, we applied for lots of grants and loans and all of that, but we never got approved so we had a lot of support from friends and family i decided to work with my wife because my wife is actually my best friend so working with my best friend is just like you're catching fun every day you're not even working <laughs> people love it people love to see the both of us work together they actually like the fact that we can get this thing started and it's been going good the beginning wasn't so easy well, right now, things are going so well, like everything is up and running. You know, we're into business. 
I'm actually like making money. <laughs> We're happy. We can have the next setup in Toronto. Hopefully we can have the next setup in Calgary. You know, you never can tell, like if we have the opportunities to um, expand as much as we can, we will definitely do that. Kind of amazing to hear people say that they are happy right now and that they're doing well right now. Uh, Lucky and his wife uh, came to Canada a few years ago from Nigeria, and you heard him there saying, you know, their next ambition is to just keep going across the country with this. Yeah, and, and I, I think there's an awareness there, too, that they want to sort of be role models, right? And they can do that just by being, just by existing. And, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see if there are more businesses, particularly in their area, that crop up that serve to that diversity uh, of needs. That's The National for this February 24th. Have a great night. Good night.